Happy 4th of July, or Cuatro de Julio, as they say in Espanol. Hope you guys are having a very good one, a safe one, perhaps uh, even one with uh, a lot of calories. I don't know if you're uh, into the whole barbecue grilling thing. Are you somebody, Steve uh, Versnick, that likes to cook out? Do you, and, and by the way, let's just, we've done this before. I want to make sure that we know that merely putting burgers and things like that uh, on a grill, that is not a barbecue, okay? That is grilling out. You are grilling out. My sister Barbecues, learned that the hard way. Oh, really? <laughs> Do tell. So, so we grew up in Ohio. Right. And, you know, barbecue is hot dogs, burgers, yeah. you know, whatever. Brats, whatever. That's what they, that's what the they call it. Yeah. Yeah. They call it, and, you know, in Ohio, it's, it's a barbecue. So my sister moves to Charlotte. This is 20 years ago or so. But she moves to Charlotte, and it's the first holidays coming up, which, you know, Memorial Day or Fourth of July, whatever, one of them, whatever. And her boss says, you know, hey, why don't you come over this weekend? We're, we're having a barbecue. And she's like, great. What are we barbecuing? He's like, we're having a barbecue. She's like, yeah, I mean, what, what are we having? Like hot dogs, burgers? Like, no, no, no. This is the South now. This is a, a barbecue. <laughs> That's a cookout. <laughs> That's a cookout. That's right. Yeah. If you're just if you're just grilling meat, it's a cookout, right? Like, but like if you're gonna barbecue, now that that involves a whole lot of different stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Not the least of which is barbecue sauce, right? Well, and- some. I mean, you got dry rub. You have dry rub. You, you can know. do it that way. Like um, I, I, when I when I smoke ribs, I I dry. Oh, rub. I love the I dry. Well, you're a, kind of a Memphis. You're like me. Yeah. I like the dry rub better than than the sauce, actually. Yep. Um, but either way, it's it's something that is that is marinated, cooked, and otherwise yes bar- barbecued, as opposed to simply throwing it takes something. Takes some time on the grill. Not it takes the, or, time. Or the, the smoker yes. or the whatever you're doing it on. Yeah, not, the green egg or not the your Schrager. five minute hot dogs. <laughs> no. Which I love uh, hot dogs on the grill. Don't get me wrong. Oh, nothing better. Nothing better. Um, and, and so I would probably, if we did something, and I don't know that we will because I'm still over in the land of, uh, of Disney over here um, doing um, the national dance competition thing. But if I were to do anything, it would be a cookout, uh, mm-hmm. not a barbecue. I have neighbors, however, that are phenomenal at it. I mean, brisket, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all kinds of stuff and, and ribs and all that. But, um, but I no, will be so. cooking out. Okay. As, uh this afternoon, uh, the Lightning has the development camp three-on-three tournament starts. So oh, nice. I'll be working that today. So then nice. after I get home tonight, we're going to just do burgers and dogs quickly on the grill. And, and since it'll be, you know, I probably won't get home till six-ish or so. So don't have time to, you know, smoke some ribs or put a brisket yeah. on, et cetera. So. Are there any uh, uh, anybody in that camp that we would see this year? With the Tampa Bay Lightning, um, Connor Geeky, there, the new uh, uh, guy they got in the trade from with Mikhail Sergachev with Utah, uh, mm-hmm. from number eleven draft pick in the twenty twenty two draft. Oh wow! Um, I don't expect him to start in Tampa Bay this season. I would imagine he'll start in Syracuse, but there's yeah. a chance he could come up this year. Uh, Dylan Duke, who uh, just signed late last season after he finished his uh, season at Michigan. Uh, it was a draft pick a couple years ago. Uh, it's possible he could get called up. There's a couple players like that. I don't think anybody's there that you're going to see at the beginning of the season, but by the end of the season, could one or two or more of them possibly get a cup of coffee with the, the Lightning, depending on how injuries in the season goes? Yeah, that's very possible. So, uh, and The tournament is open to the public, free, at the Brandon TGH Iceplex. So anybody wants to come out, the, the first part is at 2.30 this afternoon, then the championship is at – Either eleven thirty or eleven forty five on Friday morning. That'd be a great way to spend a holiday, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's air conditioned. You're in a nice rink, so you know. Yeah, and believe me, with uh, with as hot as it's been in, in the world today, uh, that is a that's exceptional uh, for the state of Florida to be able to do that. Speaking of the Fourth of July, uh, I can't tell this story as well as TJ as well as Tom Jones can, um, and we'll probably have to get him to repeat it anyway. But one of my favorite Fourth of July stories. So Tom, as you know, left the Tampa Bay Times. This would have been back in the early 2000s, uh, mm-hmm. sometime or right around 2000. He was working uh, at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. He was covering the, the Minnesota Wild for them, as a matter of fact, and uh, came back and, and covered the Lightning after that, but uh, to the Times. But so he's up there in, in Minnesota folk. I don't know if you spent a lot of time. I know you have probably spent some time up there, Steve. Is They're the nicest people in the world. I mean, I love, I love, first of all, I love the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Couldn't live there personally because I'm a Floridian. 
and I don't like that much ice. Uh, and I've had some encounters. I, I think we happened to be there with the Bucks one time, going way back when I first started the beat. It was it was the largest North American snow in a, in two days <laughs> they'd ever received. Uh, and so literally there was you know like twenty eight inches to forty something inches. It was insane how much snow there was. And I was driving in it if you can imagine that. Um, so I'm, I've, but, but Minneapolis, St. Paul is one of my favorite sort of stops, especially if it's, if it's not the winter time. Um, but so Tom moves up there to cover the wild and, and, you know, he's got, you know, a nice little home in a beautiful little, uh, you know, middle America neighborhood and a a great neighbor, a couple of great neighbors, but one guy in particular, anything you want, you know, see him out in the driveway all the time. Hey man, uh, how's it going? You know, glad you're here. Part of the neighborhood, you know, brought the warming gift, whatever. Uh, just really friendly folks. And then they didn't know anybody because they didn't have any relatives or anybody there. They're kind of on their own. And now it gets to be uh, a month or so later and it's the 4th of July. And so they're just kind of like, don't really have any plans or any relatives to share it with, right? It's just kind of a holiday. And um, the guy comes out and I don't know if it was early in the morning he mm-hmm. could fill in the blanks, but yeah, it's I think they ran to get in the mail or the paper. Yeah, get in the mail, something, paper, yeah. or something like that. And he comes out, hey, Tom, how's it going, man? Oh, great. So and so, you know, it's uh, outstanding. Happy Fourth of July. Okay. Yeah. Happy Fourth of July to you, too. Yeah. Uh, hey, just want to let you know um, we're going to have some people over, uh, you know, a lot of cars and things. We're, we're doing a big cookout. We always do this big cookout on Fourth of July. And uh, just want to let you know we're going to have a lot of people over today. In case you see cars in the neighborhood, that's we just we just have we always have this big Fourth of July cookout. That was it. Like there was no mm-hmm. invitation that followed that. Nope. He just wanted him to know <laughs> that we're having our people, not you, but our people over. And it would seem logical since he knew Tom was from Florida and didn't really know anybody in the neighborhood. Hey, you know, you'd follow that with, why don't you and Patty come on over and share? You know, have a burger or whatever they're going to do. And it didn't come. And and nope. apparently, that is apparently very Minnesota. in Minnesota, there are there are Minnesotans, and then there's everyone else. And if you're not them, then you're just not them. I guess. So I I, I lived know. in Minnesota for three winters, and we moved there from Memphis. That's where I was at before I moved to Minneapolis. Yeah, and so at, when I'm, I go take the job up there, everyone's like, "Oh, Minnesota, nice! It's it's fantastic! It's just like Southern hospitality." Yeah, and I'm like, "Oh, great! That's fantastic!" Sure. So the best way to sum up Minnesota nice is that they'll give you directions to anywhere but their house. <laughs> That's perfect. They'll, they'll be nice about it. Yeah. But Helpful if, as if, hell. If, if they didn't know you since they were in kindergarten, if, if, if you met after kindergarten, they don't really have much need for you. <laughs> They're good. They got all the friends they want. Yeah. That's kind of the way it was. I mean, all of our friends up there were pretty much from out of town. New people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were guys like you going. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the wanderers trying trying to assimilate. Yeah. Well, I mean, Hey, the Vikings assembled and they stuck together, I guess (laughs) after that, I don't know. But, uh, and the amazing thing is, is the the Minnesotans that leave come back. I'm like, why? (laughs) Yeah. Good point. I I guess if they come back, they're still, they're like, uh, grandfathered in as, as native Minnesotans. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, once you leave those winters, I'm like, why would you come back to that? Uh, Good point. That's a good the point. cities are beautiful. I mean, Twin Cities are beautiful cities. Oh, love it! One of my favorite places. Very progressive, great eating, great. I mean, just it has everything you'd want in a big city, except good weather uh, for half the year. But um, get past that. Uh, it is absolutely the coldest place I've ever been in North America, and i I've, I've been to Montana, so that's saying something. But there was three maybe. mornings when I lived there that the wind chill was forty below. Oh. The coldest uh, temperature when I was there was minus 23. I think it hit two mornings when I was there. We had a month of January. uh, I don't remember which year it was, but there was a month of January that on January 31st, it got up to 36 degrees. It was the first day all month that the thermometer hit 30. Mm. 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 And, and and I went outside in jeans and a sweatshirt to go get the mail, and it felt like I had too many clothes on. Like just take them all. Like, this is wonder. This is so hot. It was thirty six degrees. It's awesome. Uh, the body adjusts. Yeah, I, with the first Super Bowl they held up there years and years ago, um, before the last one they had at U.S. Bank when we started this podcast, as Myers back me and you. Uh, 
it was uh I, I was sort of back in the day we sent a lot of people a lot of places when there was money in the business <laughs> and um I was up there to write a side essentially I was one of, I was like the third guy covering the super the Super Bowl which had nothing to do with our teams I think it was like the Redskins and somebody as memory serves but uh, my Saturday uh assignment was to get an atmosphere piece right like I got to do what Minnesota what do Minnesotans do you know like so they had this um winter festival in St. Paul and um so I drove out there and first thing I did was get out of the car and I slipped on the ice, fell on my back. Uh, so I knew it was going to be a good day, but they were like, they were racing cars. You can imagine these things kind of sliding around the ice and on this, on, on a lake up there, uh, in St. Paul that was frozen clearly. Uh, and they had Iditarod races and they had just all kinds. It was just, it was an ice festival. They're ice carving, ice fishing, like anything you do with ice besides drink it, uh, in your glass, they, they were having it. And, so I was up there and, and the temperature, the high that day was zero. That was the high. Mm -hmm. And to me, zero is not a temperature. Like zero is zero, man. It's, and they, it was a clear day. And that's the one thing about, you know, they'll get slammed obviously by snowstorms and everything else. But then mm -hmm. it can be absolutely like if you didn't know it was freezing cold and you just looked outside and looked at the sun, it was, it was a beautiful day, clear, all of that. You'd have thought these people were in i don't know indian rocks beach on mm -hmm. march 1st like they didn't have any clothes on they were they were running around like it was a summer day and i was just like what in the hell <laughs> has happened to these folks i was just so bundled up and and uh ran around trying to find a scarf and gloves and just anything i could you know better shoes that i was slipping with obviously but um yeah hardy folk man they don't they don't play up there. It's like I can see where 36 would feel like spring to them. No question. And, and the thing is, is those days that are like 20 below zero, like the sunshine is bright. There's mm -hmm. not a cloud in the sky. Nope. Mm -mm. Like from inside, you're like, oh, it must be nice outside. It's a gorgeous day. Yeah. It's not like the Midwest, where, you know, Ohio and that where I grew up. And I didn't realize how gray Ohio, Michigan and all that is until you leave yeah. and come back. And then you're like, oh, it's depressing. This right. Is, and you yeah, don't see the sun for yeah. months. Yeah. You know, after moving away and particularly living in Florida for a while, when you go back, you're just like, this is awful. Right. Like right. the whole winter, it's like, you know, they see the sun four or five days. Yeah. Like yeah. it's just overcast and gray the whole time. You're like, ugh. Mm -hmm. Like we go two two or three days here without seeing the sun and everyone's in a bad mood. Well, you know, uh, you, you probably don't remember this, Steve. Back in the day, we had an evening paper called the Evening Independent. I used to be a correspondent mm -hmm. for it at one point. And the deal was, is that, and this is a true story, they would give it away for free if the sun didn't shine that day. And they had, they had mm -hmm. like a little, uh, they had some kind of radar or, or mirrors. I don't know what they, how they, how they measure the sun coming out, but they did. And they actually, if it was a gray day mm -hmm. and the sun didn't peek its out, head out during the day, the, the newspaper was free. And they gave it away, some free newspaper. Not many. <laughs> I was going to say, not many. <laughs> not many. That's how that's how uh, confident they were in the weather, that the sun was going to come out at some point. So, Well, my uh, uh, lawn service, the, 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 you know, the treat the lawn and make sure it stays nice and green, mm -hmm. they have on all their trucks free snow removal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Snowed here twice in my life, man, 1977 and uh, – in the 80s, late 80s, 80, 88, 89, I okay. think 89 or 87, somewhere. Well, I just know I'm covered if it does snow again. I'll have free removal. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Somebody just shovel your sidewalk. All right. Uh, so we, uh, we're we going to get into some stuff today. Uh, I think we should start uh, probably with the Tampa Bay Rays, but we also have one mailbag question from Tom Jones, of all people. Some guy yes, that but first, the Rays Peter. making moves. Yeah, they are. Aaron, Aaron Savali, Savali, gone. Your guy. Yeah, not big on it. I, I've been saying you should DFA him, but hey, there's a sucker born every minute, and the Milwaukee Brewers are actually giving up one of their high-A prospects for Aaron Savali, which is a great move for the Rays. Yeah, you've got Shane Boz expected to take his spot in the rotation this weekend. Jeffrey Springs is close to coming back, so your pitching staff, you needed to figure out who was going to pitch where. Aaron mm -hmm. Savali hasn't lived up to what you had hoped he'd be, hasn't lived up to where he where he was when he was pitching with Cleveland. So you move on from him. You get a shortstop, Gregory Barrios, 
who's going to be assigned to single A Bowling Green for the Rays and, you know, see what you can do with him. I mean, on the surface, this looks like, you you know, I guess if you're not really paying that much attention, you could say, oh, here they go. There are going to be sellers, right? Like we're getting close. We're past the halfway mark in the season. We're close to the all-star break. This is the first of many, right? Like this is the first indication that um, that they're not in it to win it, so to speak. But that's not the case. Uh, the case is that they've got better pitchers ready. And, and this has always been – Steve, there's sort of been this underlying, like, there is a cavalry if we can get, if we can get to July, right? Like there, there is, is for the pitching staff, for the pitching, for the starting staff, and 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 let's be honest, the starting staff was very questionable coming in because you had Shane McClanahan and so many guys on IR, including Springs that was coming off Tommy John, and so you know, and Boz, you know, is one of their brighter prospects, and you just like, yeah, well, if if they can make it to the all-star break and be relevant, be, be, be still be in it. Um, this thing could get even better. And, and look, I mean, as we take this podcast, they're in game two of their, their series against the twins who they're trying to run down in the wild card. Race. twins are having an exceptional year. I think they were like what, 12, 14 games over 500 or not the twins, uh, the, uh, the Royals. I'm sorry. They're playing the, uh, the Royals. Yeah. I met the Royals. They're playing Kansas City Royals who are, who are having a great season. And, that's who they're trying to run down, I think, uh, as well. But uh, they win the first game, what, 5-1 to one, mm-hmm. in a rain delay that lasted about two hours. And, you know, they, they've been playing better. What did you say? It's like 9 out of how many? 9 out of 12 many? going into Wednesday night's game. That's exceptional. I mean, that, mm-hmm. you, you play that kind of baseball, you're going to find yourself in the next 50 games, you're going to find yourself in a really good spot. And so now to get Boz back, to get Jeffrey Springs also – a couple of left-handers, which I also think is big, that that you know you're getting guys from the other side as well. No question about it. And and look, we've talked. This is this is not a signal the Rays are selling. They may end up. They got a few weeks to decide what they want yes, to do. Yes, they do. But this is about, and we've talked about it. Even if they're not sure what they want to do, this is about clearing the way for younger guys to to play. Right. You know. Right. So you you move Aaron Savali, who's making seven million ish, has arbitration for next year. Move him out of the way so that Jeffrey Springs and Shane Boz can pitch. You know, mm-hmm. we've heard a lot about Shane Boz. He's a cup of coffee here and there. You know, now it's time to see what can he do. Yeah. And and he, you know, he's not gonna you could send him down to triple A and you know, he, he can do a lot, but he needs to he needs time up here to just pitch. And it may go well, it may not go well. You don't know. You know, but you've got to see what he's got. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Drew Rasmussen's gonna be back hopefully, you know, soon as well. You know, and they may do the same for hitting. I mean, you may see someone like Ahmed Rosario traded, right. who's probably not going to be back next year. So why not give those at bats to younger guys? Whether it's Curtis Mead or Junior Caminero when he's healthy, or Jonathan Aranda if he gets healthy again. You know, we're you know see what those guys have. Give Johnny DeLuca more at bats. Mm-hmm. You know, who although to be honest, he probably should be sent down to to AAA and yeah. try to figure out some things out. Yeah, in, in my opinion, but. This isn't a signal that they're they're giving up on this season at all. This is about we've got arms coming, so let's make this move now so that they can they can just go pitch. They're not looking out over their shoulder of who's coming up to replace them. Like Jeffrey Springs is a little more known commodity, but for Shane Boz, go out there and pitch. This is your your start every five, six days, whatever it is, with off days and that. Your turn to pitch, just go pitch. And you know, there's gonna be some bumps. You're going to have some good outings, some bad outings, and we're going to learn from it and grow from it. And that's what he needs. Yeah, and I think you can do both. Like, I I, I believe that they do have some good prospects that mm-hmm. need opportunity. And, and you know, sometimes this infusion of new blood um, and, and production can help your team. And so, uh, yeah, hey, you get the guy who comes up and he's hot at the right time, um, especially this is true on the mound, I think, with these two guys, if they can, you know, iron out some of the, cobwebs of not pitching in the majors for as long as they have and they got there's probably you know some mental blocks that go along with coming off tommy john for jeffrey springs and things like that mm-hmm. uh, but you could actually make your ball club better deeper uh and still be trading from a position of strength because of what you have in the minor leagues and to me that's probably what they're going to do um you need continued health with guys like brandon Lau. randy rosarena is hitting the baseball hard you know what i mean like he's not uh maybe the average isn't going to be at the end of the year where he wants it to be uh but but he's definitely progressing uh the arrow is is definitely up for him 
And so, hey, you just don't know, man. Um, like you keep winning series, like we've been saying, you're going to be really happy where you're at the end. And they are not, they're not out of it at all. Um, but they got about, what'd you say, about a month or so, three, four weeks before. And the end of July. So we're July yeah. 4th today as you're listening to this. So yeah. you got about four weeks, a little under. Mm-hmm. And that's when the hard decisions have to be made. If, if in fact, there's a decision. I mean, you don't know, for example, who's going to offer what for which player, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, and look, if, I, to me, the big decisions are, like, if they if they decide this season is they're not going to win the World Series, let's say, mm-hmm. and, and they're looking to make they're not going to tear this team down. Like, you're not going to see the young players all traded. Right. You know, now, could Zach Eflin be traded? Who's going to make $18 million next year? Absolutely. And when we talk about, you know, next year's rotation, Pepio, Littell, Springs, Rasmussen, Boz. Um, At some point, McClanahan? Bradley, McClanahan back next year. Like, those are seven starting pitchers without Savali and, and Eflin. Mm-hmm. You know, so if they decide that they don't think they're going to make a run this year, you're right. not going to see, like, it's not going to be just trade everybody. It's right. going to be let's trade some of the veterans mm-hmm. and give the young guys chances to play. If you trade mm-hmm. Zach Eflin, it's to give young guys more chance to pitch, and you're getting rid of that salary too next yeah. year of eighteen million. You could see a Med Rosario. You could see, you know, guys like like that. You know, even an Isak Paredes possibly. If you think Curtis Mead or Caminero, whatever's your third baseman of the future, right? You might see him trade it, and it, it. But it's not going to be. You know, we're rebuilding and we, we think we're going to win in three or four years. This is about getting ready for next season. Like, yeah, you're not Rays, tearing it down. You're trying yeah, to build it back up. The you're Rays are going to say this this season didn't work. Let's yeah. get ready for next season. So let's see right. what Junior Caminero can do up here. Let's see what Jonathan Aranda or Curtis Mead can do in a long period of time where you're the third baseman. Go play. Yeah. Like not you're in a day, sit a day, in a day, sit a day. It's about development. And you got to mm-hmm. give these guys a chance to do it at the big league level. There's at some point they're only going to be able to, you know, to to go so far in triple A. Once they master that, they need another challenge. And uh I think, you know, and like I said, Junior Caminero may be ready. You know, he may be a guy that comes up here and, and um and can be consistent, you know, um mm-hmm. and, and help you right away. So you can do both and I think that's what they'll attempt to do. And then they gotta get continued production from Brandon Lau and Josh Lowe. And, uh, you know, the, the key to me will be, and I don't even know that he has trade value, but would somebody nibble on, on Randy or Rosarena? I, 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 look, I think people will try to make a move for Randy. Even though Gener- he's slumping, generally, so you, generally, you get more for players in the offseason than you do in the, the trade deadline. Right. You know, the trade deadline is more about those players that their contract's up at the end of the year and we're not going to resign them next year or we don't think we're going to be able to or, you know, we can get some better prospect that's going to take this guy's position in a year. You know, Randy's still got a couple years of team control. Yes, he's got a a decent sized salary number, but the raise salary that, you know, Ross this year was what, $96 million. It's not like they're not spending any money. So I, I don't, I don't see Randy being moved if they feel they're out of it unless the deal is just too good to pass up. But generally those deals for guys that you have under control for another few years, like Randy is generally those deals come in the off season. You get a better deal. Right. But like a, a player who, if, if Brandon Lau, whose contracts up after this season, he's one that you could trade now. Sure. Cause you probably are not going to resign him next year. Right. And you got a so, Curtis Mead, you got somebody right. who can play second base. So for Brandon, because after Lost the season you get nothing for him because he's going to be a free agent essentially. Sure, I think I think he is. There's actually an option here, I believe, but it's pretty high, and I don't think they'll execute it. So mm-hmm. at that point, you know, if you want to trade him at the trade deadline, that would be that would be someone you'd look at trading. Randy is more likely if you're going to move him, going to be in the off season. Yeah. Well, I, I like the way they're playing. When you win nine out of twelve, um, like I said going into. Uh, you know, Wednesday night's game, that's that's a good indication. And playing a good Royals team, too, uh, will also be a good measurement for you. So all those things are big. Uh, before we go on this show, at least, let, let's uh, deal with a question we got from uh, a mailbag, a listener, uh, uh, I should Tom, say. Tom actually phoned in from St. Pete. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Tom from St. Pete. I love it. Uh, First time t- caller, long time listener. 
long time listener, even longer time host at one point. Uh, Tom Jones, our good buddy, uh, wanted to know, and I talked to him uh, just this morning, and he had said he he left this mailbag question for us. Um, and we we dealt with something similar, uh, uh, you know, a while back. But I th- obviously, circumstances have drastically changed for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, we're awaiting the beginning of training camp in just a couple of weeks. God help me uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then of course the Tampa Bay Rays are playing better, nine out of twelve, as we do this podcast on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, and you know, a team that, uh, you know, could still contend very much so for a wild card spot. So Tom's question from St. Pete was, which of those three franchises, which team do you think will reach a conference championship first? In other words, not the World Series or the Stanley Cup final or the Super Bowl, but Mm -hmm. the NFC championship game, the AL championship uh, in the Eastern Conference Championship, which of those three franchises will be there first? And I'll tell you, a couple weeks ago, Steve, I thought the answer to me at least was clear cut. It's not as clear cut now because the Rays are playing better. And I'm sorry, but I have to look at their I have to look at their history of making the postseason. Um, what is it, five in a row and counting? Mm-hmm. And you never know. Once you get in, look at the Arizona Diamondbacks, which was, was the last team, I think, to qualify for the final wild card in the National League, made it to the World Series just a year ago. Uh, so you never, you know, it's it's getting in the tournament. Um, but the Tampa Bay Lightning, let's, let's start there because that's been in the news. That's the team that we've been following over these last couple of weeks and days very closely. I got to be honest with you, the, uh, I don't think there's any question and, and this is just maybe on paper. Losing to Steven Stamkos is an emotional deal, and it's it's 40-something goals and an exceptional power player, captain of the team. Like, there's all those intangible things, um, you know, that that you have to replace somehow. Um, but they did re-sign uh, and actually extended Victor Hedman, who I think is probably going to wear the C a year from now uh, or this upcoming season. Um, and so they still have a very good hockey team, and they've made lots of moves. They're a much better team than the one that ended the season low so many months ago. So to me, their prospects, it's arrow up uh, in the Eastern Conference. But I would still say hockey being hockey, toughest championship to to win and maybe to get to. And the Eastern Conference still seems more loaded than the Western Conference, which they still play in. Don't forget the Florida Panthers, the Stanley Cup champions who have been to the Stanley Cup two years in a row, is in your own division. So, I mean, that's that's a tough hill to climb, and yet I believe they're a better hockey team. I definitely believe they're better defensively and will have a much better statistical whatever five on five. No question about it. Do I think their power play will be as lethal as it was last year? No, I don't. Uh, anytime you lose Stamkos off that power play, and, and the other part of that is, is look, Stamkos, Hedman, Kucherov point those four how long have they been on the same power play together oh gosh I mean the bumper positions is switched with you know Kalorn was there and sometimes Plot would be there and in the past few years it's been Sorelli and Nick Paul and you know they would change that out but the the, uh, the four stamp goes you know and Cooch on the wings Hedman at the point point kind of in front of the net like in that bumper position like they know each other so well also, yeah. having that threat of that one-time sniper, which mm-hmm. is the best in the NHL, like you can't deny mm-hmm. that teams have to shade and respect that. They can't leave him alone on that circle. Yes. So, will that power play be as lethal and score as much as it has in, in, this year? And this year it was like the 10th best power play in, in NHL history. Like it was elite, elite this year. It's, I mean, it's always been a good power play. It yeah. was incredible this year. Right. Is it going to be as effective? Probably not. But if you're playing better five on five and not having to rely on the power play to win games as much, mm-hmm. and you still have Kucherov creating on the power play, so is the power play going to you know all of a sudden stink? No, it shouldn't it? Shouldn't no, you know. But it, it is going to take you know. I mean, those guys know each other so well. It's going to so take that is, time. That's a big change. Mm-hmm. Um, you're changing out several forwards, and and you know you've added th- guys like Zemgus Gergensens and Cam Atkinson, and you've got some you know guys there. So there's going to be some adjustments, you know, how J.J. Moser fits in. So, I mean, it's it's always an adjustment. But if Andre Vasilevsky gets back to being Andre Vasilevsky, 
which I'm not sure he was 100% at all last year. I don't think he was. I agree with you. you. Know, this is he, a big point. He came back from back surgery. Definitely the first 10, 12 games back, he was not himself. Mm-mm. Got better as the season went along and was and was pretty good throughout most of the, the, the end of the season. In the playoffs, he played pretty well. But I, I think, and he even talked about needing to change the way he trains yep. and some of the things he does. And if he comes into camp healthy and, and can be Andre Vasilevsky, and you've added Ryan McDonough in front of him, you've added J.J. Moser as a good defensive defenseman in front of him as well, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to see on, for instance, the penalty kill. And, and their penalty kill was pretty good last year, but McDonough and Chernak together were elite shutdown defensive pair in the NHL. And if, if that chemistry works again this year, that's going to be tremendous on the penalty kill. And when you need a hard stop and, and they've got their offensive, an offensive zone face off with their top line in your zone, and you can send those two guys out to be your D pair. It, it, it's That's by far the, the best defensive pair we've had in a long time. And now you can put them back together potentially this season. So I think there's lots of things to, to look forward to. You know, uh, it, do you have another offensive-minded defenseman like Sergachev on the team outside of Hedman? Probably not. So that takes some adjustments too. I mean, look, you have to give and take. You know, to sign and Jake Gensel, five on five, when he was a plus twenty-five this year in seventy games. I mean, the, the last two seasons, you know, he's not elite defensive forward, but he's his five on five play was a, a lot better than Steven Stamkos. He's going to score as many goals and be as dangerous shooting the puck as Stamkos. Not even close. No, but his defense but is com- being a plus. That's not a small thing. I mean, plus 25. Yeah. The complete game that Gensel can bring yeah. on both ends of the ice as, as a forward on that top line. Or if Hagel jumps up to the top line, some, and he's on that second line, either way, I, I, I think, you know, it works. Losing Stamkos stinks as a fan. And mm-hmm. there's going to be parts of it. There's going to be games where you're like, man, I wish we had that shot in the power play. I wish no he was question. on this line right now. I mean, there's going to be that. It's, he's he's a Hall of Fame player. Like you got to replace 41 goals mm-hmm. somehow. Yes. Now Gensel had 30 last year in yeah. 70 games. Yeah. You know, not quite 41 goals, but it's it's you know that's a good pace. So it's elite, yeah. Uh, but I I, I think Julian Breezeball has looked at the team the last two years and said the five on five play isn't good enough, and we've got to change it. Right. And he made some big moves to to make that better for this team. Or well, we're not getting out of the first round, which is what they've done the last two years, and mm-hmm. that's what they have to avoid. Now, given the teams that are still in it, including the Stanley Cup champions, what is their path to the Eastern Conference final? Can they? Well, Florida's they... lost some pieces. So Florida's right. starting to hit that cap crunch that the Lightning hit a couple years ago. There you go. Uh, uh, Oliver ekman larson has gone. Brandon Montour has gone. Um, you know, they, they're starting to lose some pieces because as you win, as the Lightning fans know, when you win a little away. and the cap mm-hmm. doesn't go up a ton in the last few years, it's, you know, $5 million the last couple of years combined, your, your players want to get paid. And when they're good enough, they're going to. And so they've lost some as well. And they're trying to retool and figure that out. So, you know, I don't expect Florida to be as good as they were. They're still going to be a really good team. You still got yeah. Kachuk. You still got Barkov. You still got... Aaron Eckblad, you got guys like that on that team. Yeah. Bobrovsky will still be in net. So, you know, Florida will be good. Boston's tried to retool as well. Toronto hasn't made a ton of moves yet. Try, I mean, Toronto's problem is their core four, the top four players on their roster, all make $10.9 million a year or more. So, like, their top four players make, like, $46 million on an $85 million cap. Of all the other top contending teams, I think the highest team's top four was something, I think it was Colorado Avalanche, like $38 million. Like there's an $8 million difference in Toronto's top four pay salaries compared to any other team. Wow. $8 million is hard to make up when you have a 20 to 23-man roster. Like it just makes the other pieces so hard to fill. Mm-hmm when other teams have an $8 million or more head start on you after your top four salaries. You know, the Lightning's top four salaries are all right around nine to nine and a half million. So they're at 37, 38 million for their top four salaries. Where the Maple Leafs are like 46. It's, 
they, but you they, still have you still have really good teams. I mean, in the East, mm-hmm. I think that's going to be you know the tough the tough hurdle is always going to mm-hmm. be there, right? Whether yeah, the Devils are adding pieces, and they have Sheldon Keefe as a new coach there, who coached Toronto the last few years. The Rangers are still going to be good. Carolina's going to be good. The East is tough, and yeah. and, and quite frankly, in the division, Buffalo, Detroit, and Ottawa should all be better. Ottawa, maybe uh, we'll see. Uh, they're making a couple moves, but. Detroit's still trying to crack that the playoffs. Buffalo's what thirteen year playoff drought. Believable, yeah. You know that's it. Those fans are incredible, and right. to not be in the playoffs for thirteen years, who? Yeah. And hockey, that's hard to do. You know the Bucks went twelve years without the playoffs. That's hard to do in the NFL too. It's hard to be that bad for that long because yeah. everything favors the reset mm-hmm. and the, and the, the competitive balance. So I okay. So we got so we got the Lightning who are better than when we last spoke. Uh, I think their path is tougher. Um, but as you mentioned, Florida's losing some pieces. You always give them a a, a fighting chance to uh, to be, because they still have elite players and 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 most of all, an elite goaltender. Who I would agree with you. I think whatever it was, uh, he realized that his training was not good. He's coming up, you know, the the back issues uh, to be rested and healthy to start a season instead of jumping in. 20, 30 games into it. Um, I think Stan, I, I, I think that, you know, Vasilevsky is going to be Vasilevsky again or has a good chance to be who he was uh, pre-injury. So that's going to be the biggest thing. So they have a shot. So that that they're better than the last time we spoke. And, and I think, uh, you know, the motion of Steven Stamkos notwithstanding, we'll see, right? We'll see what that cost them in the locker room on the power play and all that, as you just mentioned. That's the one uh, area you, that we haven't talked about is just how the room and the team gels and how right. that's impacted. Look, the players are sad Stamkos isn't there and Hedman's talked about sure. it after he signed and that. Sure. But understand the way players operate, too. They know it's a business. And each one of them want to get paid, too. Mm-hmm. And, and the Lightning have seen this happen before. Andre Palat, Kalorn. Sure. Trading guys like Tyler Johnson and I mean yeah. Ryan McDonough trading the first time and you know mm-hmm. like Barkley Goodrow and yeah. Goodrow Coleman Gord I mean go through the list big pieces of their Stanley Cup playoff wins mm-hmm. so you know the Lightning have gone through this before and so they they understand it. I mean it, it stinks when your friends and your colleagues and you know as Victor Evans says my best friend for fifteen years yeah you know that he's not there but. You're also happy Stamkos gets to get paid more. Right. He's and, doing, did what he wanted yeah. to do. And, and the Lightning have been through this, but there is a void. There is no captain right now. My guess is Victor Hedman will become the captain. Although there are other people. On the There's team other candidates, become, but, but yeah. But now that he's re-signed for four more years after this coming season. So, mm-hmm. but you know, that is a change. It is different. And, and anytime you shake up teams, how that room you know, what did we hear after they traded for Matt Dumba and Anthony Duclair this year? It, it injected energy. It, yeah. it changed their fortunes. They were not going to make the postseason. Mm-hmm. That, you know, adding two guys like that changed the room. Well, taking a guy like Stamkos out of the room can impact the room. And you mm-hmm. you just don't know how that's going to play out yet. And, and, and quite frankly, the team and the players may not know how it's going to play yet. I'll say one other thing. I bet they're not surprised by this. First of all, they're not surprised that that Stamkos, you know, would 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 take money uh, in a good contract, a big contract from from a team like Nashville, and they know he's hurt. And they understand that too, but they also know the player, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not going to say this publicly, but everything you just said about the five on five and um, you know that sort of thing, and and how they're better defensively overall they're aware that they, you know, they know why that Julian Breesbaugh came to this decision, right? Based on the offer that, that Steven had, had received and they know it's business. They're not, there's no one that's going to go skate on the ice out there next year and go, man, I can't believe, you know, that guy up in the box up there did this to us and he took Stammer away and man, we don't have a chance. Like that's just not the mentality of professional sports, right? They still have a really really good hockey team with really, really good players. Hell, one of them up was was a finalist for the MVP this year. And Point's probably going to be there one day himself, you know. Um, so it, it's not as if the, the cupboard is bare. It's it's just the opposite, actually. They're dealing from strength in a sense. So I think they – I think I would never not give them a chance to to make it back to a Stanley Cup with this core 
and the core doesn't include Stamkos anymore, but with what's what's left well, of this core. You still have two, most likely three, potentially four Hall of Famers on this team. Right. Right. I mean, Hedman's a Hall of Famer. Vazzy's a Hall of Famer. Cooch is going to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. And Point, I, I don't know if he ever gets there, but probably should be. He plays long enough. Yeah, he gets overshadowed he so much. Yeah. Um, but the numbers at the end of the day with all the goals, he may, he may, he may, you know, much like Rondi yeah. Barber, you know, but his you, longevity you, is yeah. going to tell the tale with him as far but as you, getting in the Hall of Fame. You still have Cooch and Vazzy in their prime. Hedman's probably not his prime anymore, but he's still playing at an elite level. Right. You know, and then you've got younger guys who you're excited to see the steps they take on the ice and off. And and so, I, you know, I, it's always a risk. Julian Breezewab took a big risk this this week. I mean, the easy the easy choice was to sign Stamkos and keep everybody happy for now. Right. Until, you know, you lose four in a row in the regular season and then everyone gets upset. Yeah. And now if they lose, you know, two in a row early in the season, everyone's going to say Julian Breezewab is awful. Um, that's part of the job of being a general manager. But this core and, and the core overall kind of got younger. It's, you know, I, I still think they have a good chance. Now, you know, once you get in the playoffs, anything can happen, including early exits. And you just you don't know. But you're well, trying to give yourself the best chance to go deep in the playoffs and playing better five on five, which is what Julian Breezeball tried to do with his team. If, they're, if they do play better five on five, they have a better chance to go deep. And what I will say and we'll move on to the Rays next, uh, um, just quickly, is that the Stanley Cup playoffs is, you know, the Stanley Cup actually is, in my opinion, the hardest championship to win for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is you have to win 16 playoff games to get there. You know, and, and these series have a, a mental and, and certainly physical toll, each one of them. You know, we saw games when they won the Stanley Cup, they had five overtimes in a game. I mean, like, there's a grind and a grueling nature of it that makes hockey so unique and is, you know, why the Stanley Cup is so revered when, when a team wins it. So there's that. But getting to a championship, you've still got to win, what, uh, three series? Well, know. to get to the conference championship, you have to win two. You have to win two, so that's right. eight wins. So, and, Tom, that know. was what Tom asked. How, you know, what's the team's first to get to the – Conference championship or the right, so NFC they got to win eight games but, against yeah. somebody uh, against just to two get teams. there and against then, two teams. Yeah, yeah, and then with the Tampa Bay Rays, I would say this: that no matter what they do the rest of this season, um, they've been sort of one series and done as a wild card team the last couple of years, and I, I, I think the same thing exists for them. They don't have enough offense in a short series. Um, to get over teams that have superstars that always show up in the postseason, whether you're talking about the Yankees, um, you know, certainly, you know, they, they have been able in the past to pitch and play defense with anybody. Uh, but this is not a good year for the Rays in terms of their offense, even by Rays standards. Right. Uh, and we've seen some improvement, obviously Yandy's turned it around. Randy's made some progress, but, they're not hitting home runs. In fact, they had been last. I don't know where they rank now, but they were last in Major League Baseball in terms of hitting home runs. Um, that's not a team that has improved to the extent to where they're going to go very deep in the American League postseason if, and it's a big if, that they were to extend that streak. I think they have a chance to do it. I don't think they have a chance to make it to the uh, American League Championship Series. I would say of the three, in my opinion, they're the least likely, even though we saw a team, like I said, like the Arizona Cardinals that were the last wild card in the National League make it to a World Series. So you can get hot um, and, you, you know, you can find your way there. I just don't think there's enough on the offensive side that's going to rescue them this year, uh, even from the minor leagues if they make the changes. So that one I think is tougher. I, I think it brings us back to where we were when we were asked this question about who's going to win a championship in terms of a Super Bowl or a World Series title, et cetera. This is a different question. You're talking about getting to the conference championship. And then we're at the Bucs. Uh, and to me, uh, the Buccaneers are, you know, three-time NFC South champions, albeit the, the conference has been down. It, uh, the division has been down. I, I think it's a much better division because I think Atlanta has quarterback depth, but they definitely have a 
a, a legit, you know, uh, top talent in, in Kirk Cousins, albeit he's older. Uh, they have had weapons. Their defense still not quite where I would think you'd need to be to go deep into the postseason. But they're a contender, make no mistake. I, I tend to think New Orleans is sort of caught in the middle a little bit. You know, they on the one hand, they have older players, legacy guys that have been productive, but they're probably too old. Uh, Derek Carr has not made a, an immediate impact for the kind of money that they paid him when he came over. I'm not big on their head coach necessarily. Um, I think the Tampa Bay Bucks, because of the nature of the NFL, because, Steve, I think it's the easier path to a championship, a conference championship, in that if you can win your division, which still isn't very good on the whole, not when you compare it to, say, the NFC North, right, or, uh, you know, some some of these other divisions. AFC in, North. AFC North in football, right. Uh, AFC East, even, you know, is, is going to be a tough division. Um to me, the South is so winnable, and that's why they've done it with eight and nine wins the last couple of years. We saw firsthand, you get to the postseason as a division champion, you host a playoff game. Okay, they caught Philadelphia, which was started the season 10 and one, and then the wheels came off. I mean, absolutely came off, but it still has a ton of talent, and yet they were able to go in, at their home in Raymond James, play one great game, and advance to Detroit where they came within a two-minute drive, tied in the fourth quarter at one point against the Lions, of playing the for the 49ers in the NFC Championship. It's that, it's just the nature of the NFL, is that you win your division, and hell, you could even get a bye week if you have the best record, but you win your division, you win one home game, and you're playing to go to a championship. I just think that the Bucks have gotten better. Um I think they're better on the offensive line now. It may take time for that to really manifest itself into a team that can run the football when they want to run it. I think the rookies are going to make huge uh, impact uh, on both sides of the football. Um, and and I still don't think the division is very strong. And Baker Mayfield has something about him that if he can stay healthy, and, and last year he was under siege, especially up the middle, um, if he can stay healthy in crunch time is when he plays his best football. You know, he played really well in the postseason. He played well to get him to the postseason. Um, remember that green game in Green Bay? Must wins that they had to have played hurt against Carolina. Uh, the tougher the situation, the more he kind of bears down. And so he's a, he has, he's a clutch quarterback with a better team around him this year. Now he's got some older receivers, but he's got some young guys, exciting guys like Jalen McMillan, who could absolutely – turn their offense around, you know, and, and some of the rookies that I mentioned. So for that reason, I think the Bucks still, still have the, 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 the better path to a championship simply because they got to take one step, right? Lightning have lost in the first round last couple of years. Rays have lost in the first, the Bucks did win a playoff game. They were right there against Detroit in the fourth quarter. They need to take one more step. And I think they're better positioned to do that. There's continuity you do have a new offensive coordinator, which could be a plus or a minus because there's a learning curve every time you change one. But you know what? Liam Cohen could could turn out to be much better than Dave Canales, and I could list the reasons why. So I still think, Tom, to answer the Tom question, in my opinion, uh, we see the changes with, with the Lightning. They're still a very good team. I don't think the Rays are there yet. They could still end up being sellers before the trade deadline. I still think it's the Bucks that have the better path to a championship. All right. Well, that's one mailbag question. You have a chance to ask us more. We'll do that tomorrow on the uh, Friday podcast. You can submit your mailbag questions to us on Twitter at NFL Stroud or at uh, Sports Day Tampa Bay. That's S. What is it? At Sports, Sports Day, Day TV. TV. There you go. Uh, only known the website for about uh, more than a half dozen years. Uh, and you can reach me on email, um, rstroud at Tampa Bay dot com. Have a safe and wonderful barbecue cookout fourth of july whatever you do and if you see tom jones invite him over for a burger or something just to reminisce about his days in minnesota thanks for listening for steve versus comic Stroud of the tempe times have a great day everybody <laughs>